the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Welcome to Keeble Chapel today for this, our freshest service and our official opening of the new academic year. I think I've met most of you already, but in case I haven't, I'm Father Max and I'm the chaplain here and it's wonderful to see you. There are a couple of practical notices before I say anything else, which is there are plenty of seats. Inevitably, those seats are further towards the front than towards the back, so that if you're lurking in the back corner somewhere, please do feel free to come into the chapel and find a seat. Also, today is a practical opportunity to exercise some altruism in that we have a slight order of service shortage. So if you are uh, clutching one all of your very own and you feel you can share and there is someone nearby who seems to be uh, in an order of service drought, please do um, turn around and offer something to them. It's wonderful to be together to celebrate the start of this new academic year here at Keeble. As those of you who are new to the college uh, will know, Keeble is distinctive in many ways. Its founders wanted it to be a new and different sort of college here in Oxford, symbolized, of course, by the fact they built it out of this wonderful brick material rather than the more traditional stone. They wanted it to be a more egalitarian institution, and that it feeds through the design and our culture and our heritage in all sorts of ways. And they also were very keen that the worship of this chapel should be different and special from anywhere else in Oxford. And it's for that reason that we have the beautiful colors and vestments and incense and the beauty of this wonderful space that we can enjoy together. I hope you feel that you're able to participate as much or as little as you like in, that, in this service today. Um, you're, that's absolutely fine. Join in as much or as little as you want to, but please know that however much you want to participate, you are all equally welcome here. And so as we gather together, we hold before God all that is broken and wounded in ourselves, our relationships, and our world, and we ask for God's healing and his forgiveness. God, be gracious to us and bless us, and make your face shine upon us. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, May your ways be known on the earth, your saving power among the nations. Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Christe You, Lord, have made known your salvation and reveal your justice in the sight of the nations. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
When Father Max told me, months in advance, that I would be writing a speech for the Fresher Service, I of course only started work on it a couple of days before. I'm sure this scenario is familiar to you all of leaving work to the last minute, but this situation for me was not due to procrastination, but due to a profound panic about what I am to put to prose. It's a great opportunity to be able to talk to the new year, but I wanted to deliver something that would be impactful and in doing so, I put off writing and didn't even start until weeks later. It's that sense of pressure about trying to make an impact and trying to do the perfect thing that I wanted to talk to you about today. Oxford has now, eight years in a row, been voted the best university in the world, and you have been given a great opportunity to make the most of this education. I'm sure for many, there was a great deal of pressure to even get in, and now, for many, that pressure has persisted, as you don't want to squander this chance. But not even in such high stakes as a first or a blue does this stress arrive. But even in Freshers' Week, you must be at every event, every social opportunity, or lest you worry in your room that someone's probably having a gathering right now that you're not a part of. All this festering idea of missed opportunity, if we don't do everything that we possibly could at every moment in every instance, then it, everything feels wasted. But what is the gain? Do we improve ourselves by having this rigorous critique of how we aren't already a perfect person? The evidence seems to lead to the contrary, that needing only perfection enables our worst critiques of ourselves, which debilitates us and stops us from even trying in the first place. I think of how, when we were children, we would try anything without a thought of the quality. We would grab a pen and write some poem, then grab a paintbrush and paint a sun with sunglasses, looking at a little square house with two windows and a door. We'd speak to adults far smarter than us about our ideas for the world, 
and then we'd have a try at some random sport we'd only just learned the rules for. We experimented. We tried. We didn't even think if this was the best use of our time or if it would propose the best results that we were all better for. There's a paradox that in aiming for perfection, we end up flinging ourselves far from it. You're just starting your first year at an amazing university. And to waste that away by min-maxing every second and stooping yourself from giving a go would be the true waste of all your talent. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to be your best self, but that aiming for this perfect paragon of a person is actually not conducive to that result. That we end up making the best of our time by trying things out, by doing things on a whim, and just giving things a go with no regard of whether you would be good at it. And, is that, and that is the opportunity that being at Oxford provides. We are here to learn, and you cannot learn without making a few mistakes. Thank you. A reading from the Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate. To fix one's thoughts on her is perfect understanding, and one who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. The beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction, and concern for instruction is love of her, and love of her is the keeping of her laws, and giving heed to her laws is assurance of immortality. And immortality brings one near to God, so the desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and picked them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly. The root they were the other seeds. Fold some sixty, some thirty. Anyone with ears. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There were, I think, many things that led me 20 years ago this year, difficult to believe, I know, to study at Oxford. The simple beauty of the place, I'm sure, played a role. The sense of being part of a tradition, the excitement of meeting like-minded people, and much, much more. But perhaps the thing that more than anything else that worked from the university's very successful publicity campaign was the prospect of being taught my subject by world experts in the field. What a wonderful opportunity, I thought to myself. Think of what I can learn from these people. Think of how I can use their feedback to refine and develop my ideas. What an amazing prospect. I think it took me about two weeks to realize that in my heart of hearts, there was only one kind of world expert feedback that I was really looking for. And I think it would have gone something like this. Max, I simply have nothing to say. This essay truly is flawless. To adjust even one comma would surely disfigure what can only be described as the quintessence of perfection. To reframe even one idea would be an offense to the elegant balance of its limpid beauty. Most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, are rather more emotionally attracted to accepting pats on the back than challenges and suggestions about how we might have done things better. And if we're not careful, in our mind at least, a whole university experience can be reduced to this, jumping through a set of hoops, ticking some work off the list, and passing a handful of exams in order to receive a bit of thick paper that we brandish proudly at a future employer. But if we do that, then it seems to me that we've kind of missed the point. Because if we do that, we will emerge out of the other end of this place pretty much the same person that we came in, albeit a bit repackaged and a bit more polished up. Instead, I want to suggest to you today that the point of the exercise that we are undertaking here is rather more radical, rather more 
exciting and indeed rather more countercultural in the light of our modern world. Because if we are to make the most of all these world experts who teach us, or the amazing resources of this place, or even the rich variety of extracurricular activities that are on offer here, we have first to do something within ourselves that I believe is quite extraordinary. And that is that in this place, we need to cultivate the capacity for uncertainty. That's not very fashionable these days, I know. In a fast-paced and highly public world, where each of us can potentially speak instantaneously to billions, we are all supposed to know what we think. We are all supposed to have a strong view. We are all supposed to have something immediately to say about everything, and then to stick to our guns. But I believe that if we choose to live our lives with those shallow and often unexamined kind of certainties, then it seems to me that we miss out on the far more interesting aspects of life, which are about growth and development and fresh insight. Or as John Henry Newman, one of the leaders of the Oxford movement which led to the founding of Keeble College, famously put it, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. After all, who really wants to keep believing exactly the same things for some 70 years? How boring is that? But if we are genuinely committed to this idea of growth, if we really want to learn, if we really want to develop, then it seems to me that we also have to allow ourselves to become more at home with uncertainty than our own world is today. This doesn't mean, of course, that we can't have ideas, or that we can't say what we think, or that we can't even argue strenuously and rightly for our own point of view. But it means that when we do this, we also need to be genuinely open to the idea that we might change our mind, that we might have to reconsider, that in the end, we might be wrong this time round, and what's even worse, that on this occasion, someone else might actually be right. And that actually, at the end of the day, that might be okay. There's something of this I've always felt in that gospel reading that we heard just now, speaking about the Word of God, of course. But actually, there's a message here for each of us, whatever we do or don't believe. Because what this parable is saying is, what matters is not the quantity or the quality of the information that is thrown at you, but rather how ready you are to receive and nurture that information within yourself. How open are you to absorbing something new and something different so that something really vibrant can grow? I think we all know people like the rocky ground in that story. They're good at using information quickly and rapidly pushing out some seemingly impressive certainty into the world. They're clever at just selecting the little bits that they need to justify what they've always believed all along and punching out a convincing argument. But the good soil has a more uncertain, a more mysterious, but also a more ultimately fruitful process. For the good soil can really take the information in, can make the information part of itself, nourish it, and out of it emerges not a speedily grown but easily withering flower, but a wholly new and sustaining crop for many years to come. It's not always easy being good soil. Cultivating the capacity for uncertainty means that things take time. They take effort. They take a few false starts. They don't always produce the same kind of instantaneous flashy result as the person who's confident they know everything. 
But it's something, one way or another, that I believe is worth nurturing in yourself while you're here. In this place where I hope it feels safe, maybe for the very first time for some, to learn to say the words, I changed my mind, or actually I disagree, or I think actually on reflection I missed the point of that, or I just don't know yet. Because the journey of life, at least in my own experience, really isn't one in which year by year, qualification by qualification, we know with more and more certainty what the future will bring. That's not it. But rather the journey of life is one in which we get better if we are lucky, day by day, year by year, decade by decade, at being good soil better at accepting and living with the very uncertainty that makes life endlessly surprising, endlessly creative, and endlessly new. Amen. Hello everyone, it's very good to see you all. I already got to know many of you during Freshers Week, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you at the start of this new term. I know coming to Oxford can feel quite overwhelming. I know it was certainly for me, especially with the number of social events, emails, first course readings, and to top it all off, the ridiculous number of new names you have to remember, hoping that you won't find yourself in that awkward situation where you have to ask someone three months after you met them, I'm so sorry, remind me of your name again? Or you can feel your face burning red of embarrassment. You might feel anxious about the people you're surrounded by and the requirements of the course, thinking you might not be good enough. These were all things I experienced when I came to Oxford three years ago. It was my first time leaving Berlin and studying in a, diff in a different country. And I remember feeling incredibly nervous, especially since this was during COVID peak times and everything was uncertain. I remember thinking about every single sentence during class before I had the actual courage to say anything. I remember admiring how intelligent everyone else's comments were. I remember getting panicked about not being able to read all essential readings, let alone being able to say something smart about them. And then there were also the social events, which I, especially during COVID, felt I really had to attend to not miss out on the full Oxford experience. And then of course, there were also the uh, cultural differences on top of all that. I remember writing, deleting, and rewriting again emails to professors because I knew coming from Germany, I was at risk of seeming incredibly rude just by accident. So instead of getting to the point, I learned to use the British formula of email small talk. Dear X, I hope you are well. It was great talking to you the other day. I hope your cat is feeling better. How are the kids? So, others than email small talk, clogged toilets, hard water, terribly isolated windows, and the weird habit of eating untoasted sandwiches and crisps for lunch, I also learned to appreciate a lot of wonderful things in the UK, like scones with clotted cream and jam, crumpets, shortbread, and on a non-food related note, supermarkets that are open on Sundays, which is not the case in Germany. And of course, all the wonderful people and close friends I met in my time here. Having gone through all this, let me reassure you, it will all be fine. 
Almost everyone has the same fears, even those who you think have it all figured out and succeed at everything with ease. You would be surprised how many people who seem confident and knowledgeable and say smart things in class actually scream internally and dwell on what they said for the reminder of the day, week, or let's be honest, even the reminder of the year, because they are just very anxious. My main advice is have faith in yourself. Reach out to your fellow Keyblites, support each other. You're much stronger than you think, and you have the wonderful Keyble community to help you on your Oxford journey. Please feel free to always reach out to me as the MCR president, Sam JCR president, or to the rest of the wonderful and really kind MCR committee, who's always happy to help. All will be fine, and please, please remember to have fun along the way. Thank you. Please would you stand? God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of Mary, the Mother of God, St. Mark and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Let us pray together, if you wish, the words of the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we come to the time of communion, I invite any of you who wish just to come forward after the choir do um, to the rail, either to receive communion or if you would prefer to receive um, a personal blessing, 
Equally, if you'd feel more comfortable just staying in your space, that's absolutely fine as well. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
from the Iron Age to the present day, and the importance of magic as a way of thinking about the world. He even promises me that he's going to talk about the magic army, which I'm very excited about. And that would be with a free lunch in my office, just over the quarter's lodge. Tuesday, of course, many of you who return to will know this well. Tuesday is going on Tuesday, just an opportunity for the break of the library in the afternoon again in my office, with some donuts and coffee. Wednesday is quite a special day for us because at 6 o'clock we'll be installing, officially as it were, new members of our choir and our chapter intern, who's just started with us as well. So it's a great celebration of the musical life of this place, and there'll be some wonderful music to accompany that as well. And as you see, I promise it will be followed by a chapter party, rather I should say it will be followed by going for dinner and all, and then by a chapter party after that. Um, Probably in the uh, garden of North Lodge, and I'll have to just where I live. I'll explain where that is uh, on Wednesday if you've got a lot of and I'll explain all of that. I hope you can join us to support those wonderful members of the choir that you've heard some of today. Also on Wednesday, Lizzie, our wonderful chapel intern who's sitting up there, uh, is launching her craft Wednesdays for graduate students, and that will be in the HVAC MCR, an opportunity to make some fabulous things for your room. Um, to eat some cake and to enjoy a bit of time to relax, um, as is the following day when we have Candle in Holiday Walks again. Many of you came on Thursday to go to see so many of you there. That's just every week, half an hour, simply of music, as the chapel is lit just like candles, an opportunity to relax in the middle of the busy week, and then to have a little bit of quiet socialising over the court and hot chocolate. I promise, at least the JCR would promise me, there will be no barking of animals in the college bar um, next Thursday, so uh, this Thursday, but I very much enjoyed meeting some of the wonderful costumes that we've got today. Also on Thursday night at 7 15, I'm trying to do uh, the first day of the Nodus Gag, the Red Star Project, I'll talk about it again. I'm trying to cover all the major food groups in a week, so we've got the sandwiches food group on Monday, the donuts food group on Tuesday, the cake food group on Wednesday, but I didn't want the pizza food group to be left out. So on Thursday evenings, there'll be some opportunity for free pizza and a bit of a ponder, thinking about the bigger questions of life and life, or indeed what on earth all this stuff is all about. Friday, as ever, there will be an art history from your chapel at half past six. A good thing to bring guests to if you're bringing guests to dinner that week. And then we will arrive again next Sunday when, having talked today about the virtues of uncertainty, I'm going to be talking next Sunday about another great topic for us to us here in chapel about inclusivity and about what that really means. So that will be the theme for next Sunday and I'll give us some wonderful music as we've been privileged to enjoy today in the choir as well. We gave our wonderful JCR president and MCR president a slightly half hearted round of applause after they spoke. I want to say thank you to them again and I want to say thank you to the choir who returned and I wonder if we can give them a much more confident, not quite a bit of a church service round of applause. Thank you. Uh, of course, indeed, some lunch people guide me and our great 